Good evening and welcome to lesson number eight on uh, our series, Be Filled with the Holy Spirit. Tonight we're going to be considering the mind of Christ as uh, Paul records it in Philippians, the second chapter. This is Pastor Larry Reinertsen and it is July 29th. So let's open with a word of prayer and then get into the word. Father, we do come to you in the name of Jesus, praying that your spirit would anoint our minds uh, and our hearts, Lord, to be able to discern your truth as we're guided by your spirit. We, decide, we desire, Lord, to grow in grace and to be more effective in ministering on behalf of Jesus Christ to the needs of this world, but also for our own personal growth in grace. And so, uh, with your spirit leading us, Lord, we set apart this time for most holy use in Jesus name. Amen. Philippians the second chapter verses 1 through 11 reading from the uh, English Standard Version which we're going to be using at church now. Um, the difference between the NIV the New International Version and the English Standard Version is the New International Version is translated basically thought for thought. Uh, the interpreters, they tried to try to grasp what was the writer of Scripture thinking or trying to express. Uh, whereas the RSV, the English Standard Version, the American Standard Version are more word for word. We try to capture uh, the Greek language and the actual wording of the Greek rather than just the thought of the Greek. So I'll be using the uh, English Standard Version, but they're both the Word of God. Biggest thing, use them, memorize them. It's your feeding. Hear the Word of God. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, or as some translations say, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord continue to add his blessing to this blessing in the reading of his holy word. Well, let's get into it. I believe that the mind being, ha ha being able to embrace what Paul was saying here when he said, have this mind among yourselves that was even in Christ Jesus. When we can embrace the reality of that statement and seek to develop the mind of Christ within ourselves, I believe that is the prelude to the fruit and also the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There is much more than just the limited number of fruit and gifts that we have in Ephesians and also in Romans and in Galatians. Uh, even the opening uh, passage to Philippians is a broad understanding 
of what we have in Christ, the encouragement and the mutual support, the the equipping of the saints. That's that's all part of the life of Christ within us. So uh, we need to have that mind of Christ, as Paul is saying, and that is what I want to explore. I want to explore that concept of the mind as Paul tried to grasp it in his writing. And I'm going to try to stay within Philippians. Um, I may, you know, I have to also go a little bit to Romans. Uh, there are quite a few words for mind, but I need to go have you go back and remember there are three parts to who we are as humans. There's our flesh or our bodies. There is the mind, which is called the psyche. And there is the spirit, which is called the pneuma. In Hebrews, we read how the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the bone or the, the marrow and the bone and uh, the spirit and the soul, the spirit and the mind. So mind and soul is often used interchangeably within the scriptures. You have to know the context that we're talking about. And uh, if you go into Blue Letter Bible and you click on the reference, you can actually get into the Greek and begin to explore some of the Greek words. But tonight, remember, three parts to who we are. And there are three parts to the, to the soul. We're body, soul, and spirit. And I want to look at the three parts to the soul, which are the mind, the will, and the emotion. You always have a soul, but various aspects of the soul can be deadened. And therefore, I like your mind, you can lose your mind. You can go brain dead and still be alive and still have identity. Your, your soul is your eternal identity. The mind can be damaged but the, sto the soul is still secure in Christ. Your will can be broken, but you're still uni unity in your soul eternally. And your emotions can change dra drastically as you go through life. And moment by moment, emotions can change. So the mind, the will, the emotions can all change be modified, um, in some ways be destroyed, but your psyche, your soul, that's who you are. And it is influenced by your spirit and also by eternal circumstances and impulses that come to us through our five senses. So having gotten you totally confused probably by now, I want to look at the mind, that one part of the soul that is so important for us to understand. And um, there are three aspects to the mind when we get into the Greek. And these are the three things that we've got to look at if we're gonna understand uh, Paul's admonition to have this mind among yourselves. The three aspects that you need to understand is first of all, there is the facility or the faculty of the mind, just the reality of the mind, your thought processes, your thinking, that ability, that instrument you have, probably up in your brain somewhere. Uh, that's your faculty, that's your mind. The Greek word for that is, um, do I want to use psyche? It often uses that word psyche for the mind, but we're going to be looking at a couple other words as well. Um, but you have the faculty of the mind, you have the condition of the mind, and you have the expression, attitude, or opinion of the mind. Those three dimensions. You've got a mind, that's your faculty. It's got a certain condition about it. And also, it has the ability to form opinions, expressions, and motivate our behavior 
or our actions. So that's what we're going to look at. Um, so when we first look at psyche, which often talks about the actual soul that includes the mind, um, I want to look at Philippians, the first chapter, verse 27. Um, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Meaning there, when he's talking about this one mind, it's the mind of Christ. That whole concept of who we are in Jesus Christ, what he did for our salvation, our redemption, and our infilling with his spirit. This is the common mind of Christ, not just doctrine, but it's a mindset. The other thing we have is what is called in Greek the nous, or the condition of the mind or the identity of the mind. In Romans, the first chapter, verse 28, Paul writes, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God so that God gave them over to a depraved or a base mind so that they do what ought not to be done. He's talking about a degradations that we go through uh, several stages of developing a base or depraved mind that can't determine right from wrong. Um, so the nous is N-O-U-S is the Greek, and I'll be posting these uh, out this outline so you'll have these notes. Um, so the nous says our minds have a condition to them. Uh, they can be in Christ and really sensitive to the Lord, or they can be deprived where we can't even tell right from wrong. Now, the third word that he uses that we're going to look most closely at is phroneo. Uh, P-H-R-O-N-E-O, -E for Neo. That says and encompasses the thoughts, the opinions, the attitudes, and or the expressions of the mind that are the determining factors in our behavior. Your attitude always precedes your behavior. You will act based on what is the attitude of the mind or what is the, the condition and thoughts of the mind. Paul is saying we need to have the same thoughts, opinions, attitudes, phroneo, that will govern our actions by the spirit changing the condition of our minds. Now here's where the word promises us something. That our attitudes, thoughts, actions will be changed by the change in the condition of our mind. And that's Romans 12, the first chapter, or first verse in chapter 12, where Paul writes, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, noose, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God that is good and acceptable and perfect. So Paul is saying here in Romans that Jesus Christ, by his Spirit, will renew our minds. It will make it, I believe he is saying here, like it was in the very beginning when we walked with Christ in the garden. So there's a renewing of the mind that we give up the, the mind of the flesh and the mind of society, the social conditioning that can so distort us. Uh, what we have now is a renewed mind and a renewed heart within us. Both the mind and the heart is transformed by Jesus Christ when we accept him as Lord and Savior. 
The third thing, third aspect that I want to touch on is with the distinction of the understanding of the mind. Remember, we have a faculty, it's got a condition to it, and it has an expression to it. Um, that governs our actions by the spirit, changing the condition of our mind. Um, this whole rest of the passage that's in when he says have this mind that was in, though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but he humbled himself Paul goes into what kind of mind did Jesus have what was the condition of the mind and what were the attitudes of the mind so that when we understand what was in Christ, we can seek to have that same kind of mind within ourselves. We can embrace that reality. We can look forward to the spirit trying to do this transforming work within us. Because Paul, he lays out, he says, have this mind among yourselves that was in Christ Jesus. That means we have the ability. We are not helpless. Uh, we have the ability to have our will say, Lord, I want more of you. I want to be filled with your spirit. I want to be able to uh, embrace and adopt your mindset to be my mindset. So let's go over some of the things that this will do for us. The renewed mind of the Christian will emulate the attitudes of Jesus Christ. Paul lists them here. And I'm highlighting four of them. It says, first, he humbled himself. That's an attitude of the mind. Being godlike was a sin of Satan and also Adam and Eve. Satan wanted to be like God. And in the garden, it's recorded, that Satan said to Eve, if you eat of the fruit, you will be like God. There is a natural desire within us to be godlike. We see that in our desire to build our own kingdoms, to build our own security, to build our own well-being on our own efforts and our own abilities. We want to have the right of self-determination in all things so that we can say, I have built this. This is my kingdom. This is my money. This is my house. Everything is my, 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 and I, I, I. Whereas Paul is saying here that Jesus you know, he emptied himself and he humbled himself, became as nothing. And the second thing is, he made himself nothing. So he humbled himself, he didn't want to be like God. Second thing, he emptied himself, he made himself nothing. That means the temptation, the pride, possessions, and position bring to us in life as the three greatest, I believe, temptations that there are. We want pride. We want everybody to notice us. We want to be accepted. That goes back to the garden also. The greatest fear is rejection. And that's a garden dynamic. So our pride says we are acceptable to ourselves, to others. They will like us. They will love us. They will understand us. They will follow us. They will not harm us. So all of this is tied into that pride. We never want to be embarrassed. We never want to be rejected. Our possessions are often an expression of who we are. Uh, it's an outward manifestation of an inward reality of who we are, our possessions. Now. Our sacraments or ordinances, call them what you want. 
and the church are an outward expression of an inward reality of faith. But our possessions are also an outward expression of who we say, say we are. If you have to have a shiny new car all the time, and a fancier car, a more expensive car, uh, that says something about who you are. Uh, me, an automobile, gets me from point A to point B. And if I can be air-conditioned in the summer and warm in the winter and fairly reasonable in gas mileage, uh, that's okay. I grew up in the automobile business. I was a mechanic with my dad for 20-some years, 30 years. Uh, so cars were great, hot rods, the whole thing. But I've moved on to other things, you know. They don't have quite the same attraction they used to have. Um, the other thing is position. We don't like to be the low man on the totem pole. I know when I first started in the insurance industry back out of college, uh, I was very depressed one day when I found out if you wanted to be the president of the insurance company of North America, you pretty much had to be born and raised on the main line of Philadelphia. It was a tight click that controlled the company. I had my eyes on the presidency of the insurance company of North America. Here it was, 22 years old, and I'm already stepping on up the ladder. Uh, but we all do that. We don't want to be the low man on the totem pole. We want to be the quarterback. We want to be the boss. We want to be this. We want to be that. So, that's my other computer going off. Uh, so, pride. What we think of ourselves and others think of us. Our possessions that reflect who we are. And also our position the ability that we even have to be able to rule over others. So, Christ emptied all of that. He had all of that in glory, and he emptied it. The third thing, he took upon himself the form of a servant. Now, we have a servant Messiah, the suffering servant, according to Isaiah. Uh, the whole concept of the bond servant or the bond slave, one who chose to remain a slave with the master rather than receiving his freedom. Um, he took a form, upon himself the form of a servant. Now, what does that mean? Okay, we knew he was God and son of God, but what does it mean that he really became a slave or a servant? As I thought about it, a slave has no right of self-will of determination. The self-will of determination says, I can do what I want to do. A slave does not have that right. A slave has the will of the master ruling the slave's life. You don't tell your master if you're a servant or a slave. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, um, but I'm not going to do it. I don't feel like doing it. Um, I got a headache today. Or, you know, it's too hot outside. Or it's too late. Um, we don't argue with the master if you're a slave. So when we say that Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant, Dulos in Greek, bondservant or slave. Uh, he gave up all right of self-determination. He was totally obedient to the Father in all things. Now, you don't follow that rule as much as you may think you're a great servant. When you got up this morning, the image I like to use is... We're creatures of habit. We're prejudiced. We put socks on of the same color, same style. We don't alternate. We don't wear one blue sock and one brown sock, or one green sock and one yellow sock. Um, 
we determined we want to be in harmony. We want to be the same on both feet. So from the moment you wake up, your will is engaged and you are determining what you are going to be doing. Now you may have responsibilities. You may have a boss at work who will tell you, these are your responsibilities, what you have to do. But all through the day, we're exercising the self-will of determination. And that is what Jesus gave up when he took upon himself the form of a servant. And it came to a real crisis point in the garden when he said, not my will, but thine be done. Up until that point, he sweat blood. The anxiety was so high that you break the capillaries in your forehead. Uh, that's what anxiety can do. That's what a, a rush of cortisol throughout your being will do to you. The stress level becomes so high that it affects the whole circulatory system. Uh, I had that happen doing a securities test my securities license so I can sell stock and bonds and uh, my heart went into VTAC I stressed too hard so I know what that is like when you stress as hard as you can and agonize over something I did pass the test but I also got a heart problem from it so that was the third no right self will of determination is yielded the, th the fourth thing, he was obedient unto death. Obedience is one thing. Obedient unto death is certainly something else. His relationship with the Father was the most important, and the goal of his obedience was our salvation. We all like to be obedient, to be able to remain part of a social grouping. Uh, we have relationships, we have relationships that demand responsibilities and responsibility demands accountability and accountability demands obedience. Uh, Jesus Christ was obedient to the Father, but the obedience was for a purpose. The obedience was for your salvation and my salvation. That's the view that he had. That's when he got his messianic consciousness now that's always a big debate when did he get the messianic confidence, uh, consciousness did he have it in the very beginning did he get it at his baptism did he get it at the mount of transfiguration when did he get his understanding that the task that he had in life was to die on the cross uh, myself i believe it was preordained on what is called a superlapsarian. Uh, he knew before he was born, when he was creating the world and the universe, he created it for a purpose. And part of that purpose was going to have Calvary so that our human nature could respond in faith and faith alone with love to the Father. Satan couldn't do that. Satan had to be shown that it was possible. So God, I believe, established the universe so that he could create us and demonstrate to Satan, who had rebelled against him and wanted to be like him. But he had to demonstrate to Satan that it was possible to remain in faith and obedience to the Father. So he had to create us to show that yes, it was possible, but it took a cross. It took the cross to redeem us so that we can be filled with the Spirit, so that we can be obedient in faith, even unto the death. If you ever want to read a real moving account of what sacrificial love is and obedience to God, go to the book of Maccabees. You can even probably pick it up on the internet. Um, 
it's in the apocryphal writings uh, that those sections that were written in Greek that were not included in the main Hebrew texts of our scriptures um, they were the extra writings and the book of Maccabees is very powerful chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7 um, or is it just 5, 6, and 7 describes the time Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, uh, who was the ruler of the Seleucid empires, which was Syria, uh, Babylon, that whole area there that was part of the Egyptian, or part of the uh, Greek empire. Um, Antiochus, after Alexander the Great died, he gave it to his generals, I've shared this before, and the one general had this territory it was the Near East and it was that whole area and uh, he was trying to get Israel and the Jews under control it was part of his territory and he ruled it but the Jews didn't like to be ruled by outsiders and he felt what he had to do was bring Greek culture to the Israelites and he had to stamp out this Jewish culture. So he outlawed all the readings of the scriptures, the sacrifices, the temple worship, uh, the practices, everything that was Hebraic and Judaic tradition had to be stopped. Circumcision was one of them. And part of that whole process was, and I've shared about you know, the if you circumcise the child what happened but in Maccabees there's a story about the mother with the seven sons and Antiochus was trying to get the people to deny Yahweh and to repent and to embrace the gods of both the Romans and uh, the Seleucid Empire and the torture was horrible. This woman had seven sons. And they first watched Eleazar, the priest, be martyred. And it was brutal martyrdom. And she told her sons, that's the witness we are to have in our obedience to Yahweh and his law. One by one. Antiochus took the sons and he martyred them. He cut their fingers off. He burned their feet in a fire. He scalped them, tore all their hair off, and brutally burned them and destroyed them. The mother watched one by one her sons being martyred for the faith. Never once did she cry. Amid all the pain and agonish, ag anguish that was in her heart, it writes she had two ballots, two choices. One was to be obedient to the law of God. One was to respond to the emotions of a mother watching her children being martyred and tortured. That was her choice. And her choice was to be faithful to Yahweh and his word and to continue to encourage her sons without tears, but with a word of encouragement that they were serving Almighty God. Then eventually it became her turn and rather than going through the same torture, she threw herself into the fire. So this is all in the book of Maccabees, faith of the Hebrews. You can understand why Judaism is the oldest religion in the world. So it's when you're obedient to the point of death that you really believe we can all give lip service to our faith in Jesus Christ. But when we're called to suffer for him, that's the greatest testimony that there can be. 
It so moved Antiochus Epiphanes that he used it as an example for his soldiers. He said, see the obedience these people have to their God. That's what I expect in you. And his armies became fierce, not defeated. Eventually it was just Rome who just overpowered them and brought them into submission. But when we can have that kind of mind that was in Christ, and it's available to us according to the scriptures, the renewal of our mind is possible when we believe in Jesus Christ and allow his spirit to begin a work within us. It's the spirit filling us that establishes his presence within us. So he's just not trying to clean up our act. He's creating a whole new creation where his spirit in union with our spirit is carrying on the work of Jesus Christ in this world. We are living by faith in the Son of God who loved us and who died for us. That's what we're dealing with. That's what Paul is promising. And that is what my understanding of being filled with the Spirit. Yes, I speak in tongues. Yes, I've done miracles or been uh, had Jesus do miracles through me. I didn't do them. I was just open to him doing them. And I've seen mighty miracles happen. I've seen all kind of things happen at the cross when people came to communion and knelt in our communion and healing services. I've had encounters with Christ. But all of my life is simply one thing. I want to be able to serve him. I want to be able to allow my life to be used as some kind of a testimony that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no man comes to the Father but by him. Nor the, the bells and the whistles. That always happens to me on my computer. I get I lose my train of thought too. So the more we embrace the concept of the renewal of our minds, the attitude of our mind, the thought of our mind, the expressions of our mind, what do we think about? Are we asking the Lord to keep his word always on our minds? Are we constantly in prayer, focusing our minds in prayer, in love, in thanksgiving, in praise, in intercession? Is that what we're doing? Or are we spending all our time filling our minds with the garbage on TV? These are things you got to wrestle with. Yes, it's, it's interesting at times to just go brain dead. But the unfortunate thing is most of the programs on TV in this day and age are pure garbage. And what's going to happen if you're watching them at night, you're going to go to sleep and you are going to replay these in your mind. And it is destructive to your being. It's the mind that is at peace in Christ that can heal itself and heal the body. But if you're constantly replaying the anxiety, the horror, the sinfulness of what you watched before you went to bed, that's going to bring destruction into your body. It's also going to bring many times a spirit that you don't want in your life. You're just opening the door. So I encourage you to give careful consideration to what you're watching. Uh, what you're listening to, what kind of music you're listening to. I, I feel deeply in that area. I've seen relatives uh, 
just visiting totally consumed with horror movies or sensationalism now I enjoy a good movie no doubt about it um, but I don't want sin to be the plot of the movie I guess that's why I like Mountain Men and some of these other uh, Wicked Tuna <laughs> some of the things I watch are probably boring to most people but uh, that's who I am but I do like a good movie that's redemptive that's good but stuff that uh, sensationalizes sex murder abuse of women and children no, I don't need that destroying my spirit the peace of my spirit so renew your mind ask Jesus hey I need a renewal to go on and part of that process is making commitment and this is where even believers baptism is so important when you get to the point of being able to say I no longer want to follow the way of the world I don't want society to determine what I am going to believe and how I am going to amuse myself I want Jesus Christ to guide me to how his, have his word lead me and inform me and instruct me these are the things so the more you can get this mind of Christ the greater the ability that Christ has to work through you to bless others the greater will be the ability for you to be able to behold Christ working in powerful ways. You know, I just, in some ways, almost desire to be able to reach through this video and shake you a little bit and say, hey, wake up. Your time is short on earth and you've got all eternity at stake. So use the time prepare yourself for what you learn now and what you experience now and the way you grow now and renew yourself now is going to determine what you're going to be doing throughout all eternity this is our laboratory of learning this earthly existence is here for a purpose we're being trained for eternity so just think of what's in store for us if nothing else motivates you think about that so god bless let's close with a word of prayer i hope i didn't shake you up too much i just get kind of uh emphatic with some of these things but remember it's his love both flowing into us and flowing through us that's the most important thing father we do thank you for this time and thank you for your word lord we thank you that we can really wrestle with it chew on it and the way in which it feeds us, nurtures us, and transforms us. So be glorified in us, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week.